is non-covariant quantum string theory. So in the previous video we talked about the Polyakov action. This is uh, the embedding function x mu and the world sheet metric gamma ab. ab runs from 0 to 1 and mu is a d-dimensional index. So from the point of view of the world sheet, the two-dimensional theory on the world sheet that the string sweeps out in time, this is d master scalars coupled to the metric in two dimensions. The gauge invariance is the local invariances of this action. It's diffeomorphism, the coordinate transformations along the string world sheet, and the while scaling of the world sheet metric, gamma. Together these are three invariances, two uh, coordinate transformations and one rescaling. The Poincaré invariance uh, is, a, is not a local symmetry from the point of the world sheet, it's a global symmetry since these are uh, scalars from the point of view of the world sheet. In this video I will now non-covariantly quantize this action. This gets the result quickly, but we will want to use a covariant method later. To get there, we'll impose some conditions. We need to fix these three invariances. We'll impose one condition on the sigma-sigma component of the metric, and one on its determinant. We get one left. We'll split up the mu index in 0 and 1, and the rest. Take the 0 and 1, and we rotate them 45 degrees. This looks like a light cone, because this is time and this is space. So this is a light cone, x plus and x minus. We'll fix the final freedom by demanding that the world sheet time is actually the light cone time x plus, not the space time time x zero. If you do this, then the Hamiltonian, it's the general time translations, and it turns out then to be the minus component, this component of the momentum. You can then compute the mass in string units. Remember, this is units of area squared, so this is dimensionless number. Because the metric now becomes off diagonal, you get this when you compute m squared equal to minus p squared we get the usual contribution from these transverse directions. So just to have something to keep in mind, we know that in the superstring this will be d will be 10, so this will be 2 directions and this will be 8 directions. So we'll have 8 transverse directions labeled by an index i. Here is just a quick sketch, so I'm just going to set the length of the string to be some convenient value. And then the Hamiltonian in light cone gauge looks like this. So this is integrated over the length of an open string. So now in light cone gauge we see that we don't have d scalars anymore, we have only the transverse scalars. So in 10 dimensions, this would be 8 scalars, x. We have the canonical momentum, which is d tau x. And we have the d sigma x. In uh, Susskind's video about string theory, he explains an open string composed of tiny little particles along the string. Then this would be the kinetic energy of those particles together. And this would be the Hooke's law energy if we give you this tension that the string has. And if you take the usual Hamiltonian equations of motion, from this you get the wave equation. So this is a world sheet equation of motion for these d minus 2 free massless scalars. This can be solved explicitly. Here's the solution for an open string. So we have open string boundary conditions. I put Neumann boundary conditions here and here. It's also interesting to put Dirichlet, but we'll do that later. Now this p here is the total canonical momentum, so we can call that the center of mass momentum. The average x is the center of mass location, and these are the Fourier modes. So we call those the non-zero modes, and we call the x and the p terms the zero modes. To quantize this, we impose equal time commutators, just like we would in quantum field theory. So xp is minus i. You might recognize this better if you put h bar back, but we're going to keep it equal to 1. We always set the x and momentum commutator equal to something at equal time. And on the previous slide, we had these x and p modes, and we had this alpha here. Those are our Fourier coefficients. So for the modes, we get these commutation relations. This looks pretty standard, but notice that the only non-trivial commutation relation is if they're in the same direction. For the oscillators, there's only a non-trivial commutation if the mode number is opposite here and here. So if this is positive and this is negative, we also see that the number here also occurs in the actual commutator. This is unlike the usual harmonic oscillator oscillators. If you want to compare to that, you can rescale them such that you do get the usual commutation relation. But uh, the reason this m appears here is because we have a tau derivative here. So it's inescapable that there'll be a, some kind of m asymmetry between these two pieces, and therefore you'll always get something here even if you try to rescale your Fourier coefficients. Given this, our solution of the wave equation, we plug it back into the Hamiltonian, and we get first this center of mass energy, Notice this looks a lot like the non-relativistic energy, p squared over 2m, but here m is replaced by the light cone plus direction momentum. This is also explained intuitively in Susskind's uh, lectures, where he talks about this as the infinite momentum frame, another name for the light cone frame, in which you argue that if you boost very fast, time gets dilated a lot, and then 
the string actually looks non-relativistic in this strange kind of frame. When we later work covariant, we will not need to make this kind of argument. Our results will be true in any frame. Here we see what we get from the non-zero modes. We get a number operator. Remember, this was like an A dagger. This is like an A. So this is like a counting operator that counts how many oscillators you have in a certain state. We act with your Hamiltonian. So the energy is determined by how many oscillators you have in the state just like for a harmonic oscillator, there's also the possibility of an ordering constant. There's an ambiguity when you write this down, how you write the ordering of your quantum operators that don't commute. So we have to fix this somehow. But first, notice that the mass now, we have the same formula we had before, m squared is minus p squared in string units, but p minus is our Hamiltonian. So plugging in this whole expression here, we get a very simple result. The mass of the string, the mass energy, if you will, is given by the level plus the normal ordering constant. So how do we compute this constant? We said this is like harmonic oscillator. We have to think about ordering these oscillators. Typical expression for energy of the harmonic oscillator, ground state energy. And that's completely analogous. In fact, it's the same kind of thing as this capital A here. Now we have an infinite number of harmonic oscillators, one for each Fourier mode. And so we have an infinite number of these possible frequency contributions. The frequency runs from one to infinity. We have transverse number of these, d minus two, because we had an I here. And there was a half from the half of the ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator. Now, probably most of you who watch this video already know that the infinite sum here looks very, very divergent. It's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on. But you can just look up this Wikipedia page. It explains to you that this is an old result in mathematics, probably first considered by Euler, that replaces this infinite sum by minus 1 12th in a well-defined way. Pochinski gives a nice argument why this regularization is not arbitrary. The infinite constant has to be cancelled to preserve the invariances. For d greater than 2, we see that this whole thing is negative because of this minus sign here. So this is a negative Casimir zero-point energy. And this will be important. We'll see that to get some massless state here, we have to actually put some oscillator to cancel this negative zero-point Casimir energy. So let's start with the first state where we haven't canceled it. You have no oscillators. That means you have a negative energy. This state is a scalar. It has no space-time index i. So it's called a tachyon. A tachyon is something that travels faster than the speed of light. Or more physically, it has a negative potential. The mass is, of course, the second derivative of the scalar potential. So having a negative mass means being unstable like this. This is a quote from Polchinski. It's a complicated question whether the bosonic string has any stable vacuum. And the answer is not known. I think it's fair to say that this is a difficult question, but there's certainly a lot of progress since Polchinski's book. For example, this paper discusses simple solutions for this. In the superstring, however, the tachyon has eigenvalue minus one of this operator, and it turns out to be natural in superstring theory, also for other reasons, to impose this GSO projection for things that have eigenvalue minus one of this operator are simply projected out. So the tachyon will not be part of the spectrum of superstring theory. The second state we could consider for the open string, this is actually sort of a jargon, one oscillator means one oscillator in each direction labeled by i. So I call this one oscillator, but of course really it's eight oscillators in 10 dimensions because these are transverse indices d minus two. I put in the uh, creation operator alpha minus one, acting on a state that has a center mass momentum k. The mass squared of this state, the m squared is minus p squared, one for the level. Remember we had n plus a here for the mass energy. We see that this is actually 26 minus d, and we expect a massless vector would have d minus two states in d dimensions. So if we wanted this to be massless, this should better be zero, in which case d would have to be 26. And the way to say this is that the stabilizer group or the little group of the Lorentz group in d dimensions is SO d minus 2. So in d equals 10, it will be SO8. In d equals 26, it will be SO24. Sometimes this is stated as saying that bosonic string is only consistent in 26 space-time dimensions. This is a little dangerous statement. A little better to say quantization of bosonic string theory only preserves d-dimensional Lorentz symmetry in d equals 26. And I'll come back to later what the important distinction is between these two statements. Now, what kind of state is this? I claim it's a photon. It has a space-time vector index. Now, we're not working covariantly, so it only has the transverse directions. I claim that in covariant quantization, it will be a mu index. If you multiply it by a constant matrix representing the gauge group, it will also be able to represent a gluon. But for now, let's just think about the state here. It looks like this. So I just plug in these numbers here on the right. You get this simple rotating open string. For closed strings, solve the wave equation. For closed strings, I get something very similar to the open string, except I get left movers and right movers that I denote by alpha tilde. A massive state here, by the same logic as before, will need to have an oscillator. Now we'll have an oscillator in each of the left and the right movers. So this is a, from the space-time point of view, this is an object that has two space-time vector indices. So it has two indices, meaning there are d minus two squared states in d dimensions by the previous argument. This is a massless tensor then. It breaks up as a symmetric plus anti-symmetric plus trace. 
So for example, in four dimensions, we're not directly working in four dimensions, but because you might be more used to the counting there, uh, d minus 2 in four dimensions would be 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 is 2 plus 1 plus 1. So in, in four dimensions, you would have two symmetric polarizations, one anti-symmetric and one trace. A symmetric two tensor that has two polarizations will be a graviton. So the graviton is described by the symmetric part of this massless state of closed strings. What the other two objects are, the anti-symmetric and the trace, right now they look like some kind of extra junk. We'll get back to them later. So this is what a closed string oscillates like in this symmetric state, the graviton. Here's the trace, just for fun. You can figure out yourself how to get this, this uh, animation. For later, it's interesting that the uh, additional gauge invariance in the closed string of shifting the origin around the closed string can be fixed by setting the operator P, which generates translations along the closed string, to zero. This imposes that the left and right movers should have the same level. That's what I didn't consider just putting in a left mover. You might have thought that should be a natural thing to do, but I actually have to put an equal number of left and right movers into my state. To summarize, quantum strings in light cone gauge, you go to these coordinates, light cone coordinates, that allows you to fix these three conditions using the standard method from the Polyakov action and get this Hamiltonian. So now you have d minus two massless scalars. The Hamiltonian equation of motion is a wave equation, can be easily solved given some boundary conditions, for example, for an open string or for a closed string with periodic. You impose canonical quantization conditions at equal time. You get these mode relations. And then you can take these oscillators that look like harmonic oscillators. We have an infinite number of them indexed by an index m. The negative ones will be the creation operators. Positive ones will be the annihilation operators. So I put in my first creation operator, and I act on a state that has no oscillator, but k center mass momentum. I get a photon with an additional matrix in front. I get a gluon, and I get a graviton by taking the symmetric part of this closed string state. This looks like something that rotates. This looks like how a ring of test particles will be affected by gravitational waves. So it should give you this feeling of a graviton state. And we'll get back to this later. Non-covariantly, we have fixed the world sheet metric. We fix space on to be flat. The symmetries are not manifest. This is not really convenient in many respects. We'll do covariant quantization. It's in Polchinski chapter three to five. It is more work, but it's worth it. It sheds light on a lot of other things you might have learned. It's a very nice structure.